I'm delighted to be able to come and share some information about the STEPS program, which uh, is certainly associated with the University of Iowa. Uh, and, um, but I would like to tell you a little bit about how it started and where it is used. I am a clinician, um, and so I do want to talk about its clinical application and hopefully to actually leave you with at least one tool that we use in STEPS, but that many other programs and therapists have found useful. So uh, STEPS, which does stand for Systems Training for Emotional Predictability and Problem Solving, refers to not only teaching and training a person uh, with borderline PD in emotion management and behavior skills, but also to teach the language of the model to all those in their system with whom they regularly interact and share information. Family members, significant others, other healthcare professionals, other people in their system, whether it's substance abuse treatment, whether it's voc rehab, day treatment programs, and so forth. And I'd like to say that I developed this concept by myself, but in fact, this built on a very small program originally developed by Norm Bartles at the DuPage County Health Department in Wheaton, Illinois. And over the years of working with the program and adding to it, Norm Bartles one day called and said, put the pieces together, this is your program. And so it was built on this little 72-page, 12-week model to expand, as I will tell you. At the same time, we acquired a wonderful colleague, Don St. John, who has worked with me since 1995. But there are two people who, I, because of them, I am the one standing here today. And both Don Black and Bruce Fall um, have given me 27 years of friendship, training, teaching, mentorship, and support. So I, as they said, this is my opportunity to publicly thank them and for you to also be able to talk to them over the next two days. At the time we developed this, Bruce Fole was the director of the outpatient clinic, and when I came to him with this idea, he not only encouraged me to do it, but he actually sat in on many of the first sessions. And Don Black, who was staffing the inpatient unit that housed many of these people, would come in my office weekly and say, we need a grant, we need a grant, we need a grant. And it was through his persistence that, in fact, we were funded uh, by NIMH and even more persistent that we are now able to join the list of evidence-based practices. In terms of disclosures, I and my co-authors do receive royalties from the publisher of the various versions of STEPS. And in addition to the people I've mentioned, there's an incredible team at the University of Iowa, as well as colleagues in the UK who have made this development possible, and for the uh, Iowa Department of Corrections to support the expansion of the program into the Iowa prison system and now into others as well. Okay, and a very, very quick review. Um, of where we are in the middle of the country because my family in Boston still refer to the stray family member who lives way out west in Iowa. And so Ohio and, Ohio and Idaho are not it, but these are perhaps the images that you associate with Iowa. So we'll move on from there. And in terms of where STEPS has gone, as it started in the middle of the country, in Iowa and Illinois, 
it's been very, very exciting to see all of the places it has gone and now the, uh, the number of translations that are available or will be available by the end of the year, as well as the different settings. So, um, I will tell you that um, RCTs have been completed in Iowa and the Netherlands as well as seven or eight non-RCTs and the overall outcome uh, is to reduce the uh, symptoms of borderline personality disorder and also in our most recent publication of 77 case, uh, offenders in the correctional system to reduce self-harm, suicide attempts, and disciplinary infractions. As I've started out saying, I am a clinician. I do not speak statistics well. However, both Don Black and Bruce Cole are fluent. And so again, if you would like more specific information on measures used and so forth, um, they will be around as well. And um, there is on the website uh, for STEP a list of these studies. Um, what is I think kind of exciting to me is that STEPS was developed originally as an outpatient program that patients came once a week and um, uh, the idea being that they would learn a skill or part of a skill and then take it back to the natural environment. And to watch the various settings now in which it has been applied uh, has, has really been very, very, I think, exciting and interesting. And again, it was developed primarily for adults. However, it has been used with older adolescents. And by the end of the year, thanks to our colleagues in the UK, we will have a version for adolescents that focuses not on the term borderline personality disorder, but emotional intensity difficulties, and I'll come back to the EID. It is a group format, which allows people in the group to see that others have the disorder. It is also a safe place to practice the skills. And it is psychoeducational. Part of that is, be, and I was interested in one of the questions that came up, because my original background is in teaching. And so a teaching approach is what I am comfortable with in therapy. It is manual driven, and it is a combined model that uses cognitive behavioral and skills training and brings in schema-focused therapy as a unifying concept and the, the, that patients learn to recognize the uh, relationship between the basic underlying schemas, the symptoms they're experiencing, and the skills to be able to challenge those schemas. And it includes the reinforcement team, and that's the name we give to all of those in the system that they're going to share information with, as well as materials that we will provide. And so I think it was when, when, I, when Charlie talked about coaching, we are helping all of these people to be coaches. And the leaders of the STEPS group are also reinforcement team members, so we are accessible. And perhaps one of the, I, I think one of the most important outcomes is the development of the common language to communicate about the disorder, about the symptoms, and about the skills. Because I've always said that part of the most powerful thing, I think, in mental health systems is that it is interdisciplinary. Perhaps sometimes the biggest stumbling block is because each part of the system has its own language. And so when a patient is in crisis and their thinking is rather chaotic and they go to one person in the system 
who speaks the language of psychiatry, and then they go to another person in the system, and they speak the language of social work or case management, and then pretty soon the patient says, but my psychiatrist says, but oh, my social worker says, oh, my voc rehab person says, and then what do we say? We say, oh, those darn borderlines, they're always splitting the treatment team. And I think that, as they say, think of yourself when the situation is chaotic. Several people can be giving you essentially the same message, but because they use different words, it's often easy to believe that they're saying something different, which only increases the chaos and the emotional intensity. Step focuses on the present. We validate that people have had difficult pasts. But we also talk about the fact that we can't go back and undo it. We're trying to reduce its power on the present and the future. At this point, we connect people's behaviors to their symptoms and talk about learning to manage them and to move away from thinking of themselves as a hopeless victim and there may be many cases where we could lay blame at the feet of perhaps many situations in their life, but blaming really does not move us forward. And to not expect other people or things to rescue them, that we can help them, we can teach them tools, but we cannot, we can't stop the pain, we can't stop the behaviors that are getting in the way. And I think something very empowering is that we are also asking them to teach what they are learning to better allow their current support system to reinforce and to respond to them. And we build this actually into the group sessions where they go up to the board and actually do some of the teaching and, uh, and as they say, this is very, very empowering. The way it was basically designed is weekly two hour sessions for 20 weeks. We like to have two facilitators with what I call a finished group of six to 10 trainees and we don't require, but we certainly encourage individual therapy to reinforce skills. And what that means is that although the individual therapist does not have to be specifically trained in steps, there is the agreement that during the time the person is in the steps program, the individual therapist will be a member of the reinforcement team, the person in the, the steps group will take his or her notebook to their 20, you know, to their individual session and teach what they are learning, share their homework as, as they are comfortable uh, so that, again, everyone is using the same language. And we find that individual therapists are often very, very pleased to be a part of this and to know that for the next 20 weeks they'll do something besides crisis management. We encourage adherence to medication recommendations with realistic expectations. Um, I always love Tom McGlashan's quote a few years ago in which he said, hunger is the only life problem always changed by swallowing something. And as, as you know, has been pointed out over and over, there is no medication that is totally effective. One of our patients said on a videotape, my medications are like my crutches, they help. They are not the fix-it answer. It is a three-step program. I always point out that we need nine more steps to play with the big guys. But the first step is the awareness of what is this entity that we're calling borderline personality disorder and that we are looking at the criteria as symptoms of the disorder. And then, because no one likes the name, 
Um, and, and because we have found that patients will tell us emotional intensity disorder is the way they experience the disorder and that this resonates. It also has very conveniently now also been able to be adapted to emotional intensity difficulties. Um, there are five emotion management skills which are listed here and eight behavior management skills for very specific areas because as we know, when emotional intensity is out of control, it impacts behavioral skills like eating, sleeping, exercise, uh, be you know, more likely to lead to abuse, uh, and certainly impacts relationships. On the other hand, when those behavioral areas are out of control, it intensifies the emotions. In terms of measuring change, and again, because this poll is here, um, this is a perfect opportunity if you'd like to talk more about um, the assessment tool that we use on a weekly basis and uh, was used on a monthly basis. It is called the BEST, which is a one-page uh, uh, assessment tool that patients fill out and consists of three parts, thoughts and feelings that are typical of borderline PD, negative behaviors, and then as a patient pointed out when Bruce and I were in the process of asking for input from the group, they said, but you had no way to give us credit for our positive behavior, so in fact we do. Patients are given a weekly a graph that they put their weekly score on, and progress is visible to them. And uh, the again, the best is available. We are always happy to share it. If you say, you know, I just would like to perhaps have that piece, you email, we will be very happy to share it with you. The awareness of illness portion focuses on describing the criteria as behaviors, not focusing on the names. And to try to remember that behavior is everyone's attempt to meet basic needs. And we can look at many of our patients and say, well, there's a lot better behaviors they could use. And that is true. And that is our job to help them to adopt new behaviors. But the goal of the awareness is for the person to identify the criteria that seem to apply for, for them and to be able to give examples from their own life uh, and to acknowledge that the problems they're having may reflect the criteria. And I think the thing that is really important is that they are able to at least entertain the notion that he or she can learn to manage these symptoms. If the person believes the only way they can get better is for other people to change or that they absolutely cannot engage in learning the behavior, this might not be the treatment for them at this particular time. And the tool that I'd like to share with you that, again, I have found has been useful to people doing many kinds of therapy and for problems other than BPD. It is what we call the emotional intensity continuum, the original concept that Norm Bartles had for the highest level was the tornado. And interestingly, this is a drawing a patient brought in that she had done years earlier when asked to describe how she felt. Uh, Norm had come up with this rather abstract notion of a five-point continuum, and one of our goals throughout the STEPS program is to make these concepts as concrete and visual as possible. And we thought we were extremely clever as we came up with the weather symbols that started with the sun shining and moved up until the, we reached the tornado. And uh, 
that seemed to work for our patients where we live in the Midwest, but we soon found two things. One is that the tornado is not a universal metaphor. The other thing is that um, I am the world's worst artist. I would get to group early, put up these pathetic drawings, and in one group we had someone who would get there even earlier and started to put up very nice drawings. One day she said, next week there will be new drawings. And when we walked in, here were the pots on the burner. And she said, you know, I have no more control over the weather than I do my emotional intensity, but I can control pots on a burner. And it's a universal metaphor. Uh, so I'm going to just give you a very quick run through of how we work the emotional intensity continuum. And as you can see up at the top on the uh, left-hand corner, it says event, what happened. And you can see that that's a pretty short line to write on because the problem that we always identify is not the event. The problem is the emotional intensity in response to the event. Now, as they move further into the weeks of the STEPS program, there actually are written worksheets that uh, they can use to describe things in more detail. But the idea is that this is an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper in which they can look at how episodes develop and see the common patterns, see the typical feelings, physical sensations, thoughts, filters, which is the, we use the term filter in place of schema just because it's an easier concept, I think, for people to grasp. Action urges, what do I want to do, and what behaviors actually occur. But you then get to see a picture and to connect what behaviors, thoughts, feelings, and so forth go with each level of intensity so that when someone calls up and they want to describe a crisis, we are not going to say what happened. We're going to say what number are you? And I think some of, again, that comes out of my background in working with anxiety disorders and OCD and scaling. Uh, and um, so I think, and again, I think a five-point scale is enough to, for them to keep in their heads. Um, so that when someone calls up and, and you say, what number are you? I'm at four and a half on my way to five. Okay, we can immediately say, what are you going to do to either hold the line or to notch down? We are not going to expect if someone's at four and a half going to five that they're going to immediately be able to get back to one. The goal is that you not go on to five. All right, so let me give you an example. And across the bottom, I know it's very small, we have listed the common filters that um, uh, seem, to, seem to apply. And at the top is uh, the list of um, the common skills that, and one of the things they can do as time goes on is in going back and looking at the emotional intensity continuum of either being able to write or circle the skills that you used or could have used. Um, by the way, there was a group that drew their own continuum, which was a volcano at various stages. We actually give all three designs in the manual, and we ask facilitators to print them all out because we will have people who say, oh, I feel like the weather symbol this week. I think I'll take the volcano. Um, we actually are, um, have, there's a men's group going on now in the UK, and we had given an example that was done on the pots. It was a substance abuse example, and we had an email from the facilitator saying, could you send us one on the volcanoes? Because the men in the group think the pots are rather girly. Okay. So let's look at an episode. 
And um, I've, I've tried to simplify this a bit, okay? Um, we, when we first introduce this, we start at one. And what are typical thoughts, feelings, behaviors, et cetera? And then the event occurs, the boyfriend is late, and what happens? Now, if I said what happened next, do you think that people could go to two and then three and then four? But what's it like? Something happens when you are at one and you are immediately at five. So we go to five and we're like the Monday morning quarterbacks. We work backwards several times before they have that internal sense of where they are. So you can see the kinds of intense feelings, physical reactions, um, the thoughts. The thoughts are always dramatic. I'll never have another boyfriend. Um, the filter of abandonment, which was er mentioned earlier, and in this case, social undesirability is the secondary one. What's the action urge to self-harm with cutting? And what are the actual behaviors? As you can see, screaming, throwing things, and cutting. Then we go to what was happening right before that. So you're already introducing the idea that there are different levels of intensity, whether it's feelings, whether it's action urges, whatever the thoughts are. And so we can see that that action urge is to self-harm. Um, the behavior is crying and looking for a razor. So you still have a choice point before you are at actual cutting. And what's happening right before that? Uh, and so again, we see a different level of feeling and what was happening right before that. Um, they have a huge list of feeling words that they can call on. Actually, on the back side of the continuum are some suggested, just some small categories, uh, and um, as well as phil uh, physical sensations. But again, you start to see that there are different levels. So you may be uh, irritable at two, angry at three, fuming at four, and boiling at five. Is it make some sense? And again, if you want a copy of that particular piece, I am very happy to send that. Uh, in terms of the family and staff, uh, the, we call the reinforcement team, Part of our purpose is to empower them to give the kind of consistent responses as well as, again, to make the system work more efficiently and to provide information and guidelines for coping. So we have some brochures. Again, um, these, are, these are part of the program. The idea is for them to have consistent responses because oftentimes as therapists, when we've gotten the third or fourth call from someone, we have the sense of frustration as to you know, what we're going to say when we're, working, when we're not working in a structured model like this. For families who are dealing with it 24-7 or friends or significant others, their frustration mounts very quickly and their emotional intensity can certainly go very high. So we have a piece of, of a card stock that they can give to anyone they identify on their reinforcement team and as they add people through the course of the 20 weeks, they can pick up more of these. Um, very cleverly, one of the people in, our gr in a group worked for a printer and so she put them on business size cards and laminated them and we now have a whole set of the business size cards for the emotion management skills, the filters, the cognitive responses, as well as what we call responding to the person with emotional intensity disorder. 
And these are the basic questions. Where are you? What number are you? So no matter who they call, they don't have to know anything about the model more than reading what's on that card. Have you used your notebook? What skill can you use? How will you use it? And if the person cannot think of a skill at the moment, all the reinforcement team person has to do is go down the list. Have you distanced? Have you communicated? Have you challenged? Have you distracted, et cetera? There's a list of behavioral skills also so that if it's very early on, there are still things the person can say, yes, I've done, or yes, I will do. And finally, um, one of the things, of course, we found, and you may have caught that as you were looking at the graph of their, uh, from their best scores, is that pretty consistently the scores are going on a downward slope. We get to about week 17 and we were talking about the group ending and the abandonment filter kicked in, scores suddenly spiked up. Now they came down very quickly. But we also found that we had people who wanted to repeat the steps group, even the, and, and we always allow that option, either the patient initiates wanting to, re, re, to repeat the group, or we may, as, facil as facilitators, encourage them not to see that they failed, but to be able to go through it at another level. Um, however, it did lead us to develop a one-year, just twice monthly program to, again, reduce the abandonment fears and to decrease the intensity of service because, again, for many of these people, as you saw in the interview, she has been in therapy for 10 years. That becomes the way of life and the and there is often not time or motivation to put in other activities. So we meet two times per month, and they work on additional skills because I think one of the first things Mary said is that they may be able to achieve remission from the symptoms. However, um, they may very well have lost or never developed many of the social skills or even basic occupational skills that would allow them to return to some kind of gainful employment. And so we try to work on those kinds of skills. I always say that steps gives you the skills to survive, but stairways helps you thrive. And it also reinforces the previously learned skills. So these are the names of the skills. Um, I credit the acronym STEPS to Bruce Fole, who pointed out that all of the other treatments had initials, um, but we did not. And I said, well, this would be a very good job for you. Um, however, after he cleverly came up with STEPS, I was trying to think of the sequel. And I came up with stairways, but then I struggled to find the names of skills that would fit the letters, which is perhaps a little bit backwards, but um, this, the, the entire program, the two parts are referred to as steps. And finally, I'd like to just finish with some comments from participants. Um, and certainly, um, again, as, uh, you can appreciate this is about eight hours of material condensed to 20 plus minutes. Um, is it all right if there are some questions? Oh, okay, no, I'll, I'll just put this up and um, is there time for a question or two? Okay, and again, I will be here all day today and tomorrow and I am always available by email to answer questions, but if you have any you'd like to ask right now, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for the presentation. Can you tell me a little bit more about your follow-up groups? Uh, do people really show up for the kind of refresher courses that you were talking about, the following up steps? I'm asking because I might have seen other more local uh, 
experiences where it was a kind of security given to patients, but they did not actually show up, and obviously it's a bit of a problem if you schedule time and it seems useless, even though you can do chart. Uh, I was wondering to what extent you have a lot of follow-up, or is it that you have a large cohort and enough people then that will come in just after the training that will be kind of fresh and still wanting to um, reinforce what they've learned? We, we actually, uh, I'm, I'm, that I'm so glad that you asked the question because um, we, have, we do have people who have said, um, and this is particularly true in stairways, that very often people use it as somewhat of an aftercare program in that because it is much less intense and they only come twice a month, that we have people that go through the stairways program and say, you know, I, there, I, I would like to keep coming. Um, and so we do allow that. Now, one of the things I should say is the tr uh, when the STEPS program starts, it is then closed for the 20 weeks because each skill builds on the next. With the stairways program, people can come into stairways at any point point after they finish a steps group and at the beginning of one of the skills. Some of the skills take two or three sessions to teach. So we don't want somebody to come in in the second session of anger management, for instance. We would say, okay, you know, um, on this date we'll be starting with a new topic. And then they just stay in until they've completed the sequence. But as I said, there are people, and there are people who will say, you know, could I just come back when you're doing the five sessions on relationship management? And so we will just send them an email saying, you know, in two weeks the relationship section will start. However, we also found there were people who said, you know, I don't want to come back for 20 weeks of steps, but I would like some, you know, periodically to have a refresher. And so we have in progress um, and we've actually run several groups now so that the manual can be formalized. And that is an eight week refresher course that focuses primarily on the emotion management skills, but also does a very, it does bring in a review of the behavior management skills, the eating, sleeping, exercise, and so forth. Uh, so it does allow people to do this. We experimented with a once a month group that would be for the graduates of Steps and Stairways in which we actually had a group for a year that decided to focus on one topic and they, to they chose the topic of self-esteem and they asked that there be a facilitator in the room but not necessarily that the facilitator would have to actively lead the group. So we did it at a time when uh, the stairways group was meeting and uh, one of the two facilitators could rotate uh, doing the monthly group. And, um, you know, again, that could be another model. The other thing I would like to emphasize is that although it's written as this 20-week, once-a-week, two-hour program, it is very flexible depending on where it is used and what the schedule is for the facility. For instance, in our correctional facilities, um, oftentimes it's a 90-minute session twice a week and optional 60-minute homework session once or twice a week. Again, it, it allows the uh, group setting to have that flexibility. In residential treatment, two hours is sometimes too long for some people, and so they may be doing two one-hour sessions or three 45-minute sessions. Um, again, we, we have structure, but hopefully the flexibility to adapt it to a variety of settings and, and a variety of populations. Um, to keep you from being completely off schedule, I think what I'll do is stop here and please, I will be walking around for the next two days. Please feel free to ask me questions. Thank you.
we were a little bit off schedule, um, partly because we can't help it and partly because we chose to do this, but we're now gonna take our break. <laughs>